afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me this evening. And also thank you for the British Tobacco Club for uh, hosting this event, the second of uh, my series of talks. Quick couple of slides on myself. Um, some, of you, some of you know me, of course, most of you don't. So I've been diving for 30 odd years. Uh, I learned to dive on rebreathers, oxygen rebreathers. Um, it's been a passion of mine for the last three decades. And uh, picked up a few boys, boy scout badges along the way and instructor, instructor trainer on rebreathers with a number of training agencies. It all started uh, a very long time ago. I joined the Royal Marines and after about uh, five, six years of doing that, I ran around the hills of Wales and the jungles of Brunei and then uh, qualified as an SF uh, operator and learned to, learned to dive using rebreathers. I then went on to uh, qualify as a diving instructor and diving supervisor. And that's when I really got to appreciate uh, oxygen diving in particular. And the last three or four years of that job, was piloting and navigating swimmer delivery vehicles, a job I absolutely loved. Uh, wet combat submersibles launched from big submarines or from a surface ship or helicopter, and uh, very complex diving operations. Um, but uh, yeah, very enjoyable. Although you might imagine uh, had its had its own challenges, particularly when you come to diving for ten hours. And during that period, I got involved with various repeat the trials. Um, with various manufacturers and then after leaving that job the last two decades I've been working uh, sort of uh, in sort of design and test of military rebreathers um, including the unmanned and manned trials and uh, are very active on the actual test diving side of life both of the rebreathers and the vehicles themselves so part of that job as well well, is working around the world, training training various uh, military teams uh, using various equipments, electronic rebreathers down to 80 meters, or just simple oxygen rebreathers for special operations tactical diving. So that's a quick summary of my sort of a uh, potted history of my th last 30 years. So the subject this evening is uh, has been an interest of mine for 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 many a decade, and to get it going. Between 1942 and 1945, the Royal Navy they conduct human trials on hyperbaric oxygen toxicity. They conducted over 2,000 man dives. And this has set the framework for submerged oxygen PO2 exposure limitations in man. And it's likely to ever be repeated because of the ethical reasons that will become apparent when we get into this presentation. So I'm aware uh, we have quite a broad range of interests amongst, uh, amongst the audience this evening. There are those uh, who are interested in general diving history. Um, there are retired and serving um, special operations and mine clearance divers. There's open circuit and rebreather sport diver from novice to expert. Um, so hopefully I've got something for uh, all of you. And there's quite a backstory to these experiments. And I. I feel the backstory is worth going into in order to put everything in perspective, both historically and ethically, because the experiments at times were pretty extreme. So we're gonna look at early physiological research and oxygen would be the development up to 1942, up to the beginning of the trials themselves. We're gonna look at the development of the self-contained free swimming oxygen diver, or the frogman in 1940s language. And what we mean by self-contained is not tied to the surface by an umbilical, right? It's free swimming. Then we'll discuss the World War II urgent operational requirements that justify human experimentation. We'll look at the trials themselves, the output from those trials, and then the relevance for today. So there's quite a journey we've got uh, this evening. So I hope you can stay with us. And okay, before I kick off again, units of pressure. Um, yes, I did pay attention to my schoolboy physics, and I'm very aware that there's about 101 kilopascals to a standard atmosphere. But for tonight, let's try and unify the scientific world. And for practical simplicity, one bar equals one atmosphere, equals a thousand millibar, 10 meters of water, or 33 feet of water. 
and I'm going to be skipping between these pressure death metrics without a scientific care in the world. Okay, they all mean the same thing tonight. So after leaving the, the Royal Navy, Mr. Kenneth Donald went on to have a to have quite a distinguished career in diving medicine and uh, diving research, and he eventually settled in the wonderful part of the UK called Wales. And in 1992, the then Professor Kenneth Donald, a uh, distinguished service cross, he won that in World War II, he published um, Auction of the Diver, which some of you may have come across. And I had just quali recently qualified as a combat diver and uh, were taught, had been taught quite a lot about auction toxicity, understandably, but not quite enough to satisfy me, my curiosity. So I went out and bought this book as soon as it was re released. And it's here now in my hand. And I bought it from WH Smith in Poole and I paid $14.95 for it. The book is out of print and it's secondhand. These are going for over £200 now online. So it was a good investment. But the book, the book itself uh, details uh, these human uh, toxicity experiments and also the development of the oxygen and the nitrox we breathe during World War II. So I've probably read it at least three times cover to cover over the last three decades. And it's a frequent uh, primary reference source. So to set the scene, I'll take a quote from the book by Professor Donald. It was a strange scene as divers were lowered into the wet pot, particularly as a number were hauled out unconscious after convulsing. Occasion, the next diver stepped over the casualty to take his turn. So let's pause for a moment and repeat those words again. You volunteer to do something. You see your buddy haul out of the recompression chamber, unconscious, and now it's your turn to, to step across him and have a go. That's the circumstances in which uh, the, the, the volunteers were working under. So before we get to the trials themselves, we're going to jump back in time. Let's look at early physiology research and oxygen rebreather development. Well, if you're going to talk about oxygen, you need to understand what it is first. So it was discovered um, around about you know 1772, 74, 75, whatever piece of literature you choose to, to read. I believe Carl Wilhelm Scheele was the first to isolate the gas in Sweden. Joseph Priestley in England first was to document it, and Anton Lavoisier in France named it oxygen and i've read that these three gentlemen were somewhat collaborating to a certain degree um so it, you, could, you could kind of call it a shared discovery but that's that's when we got to understand that there was this gas in the atmosphere and that was what what was keeping animal life alive shortly thereafter anton lavoisier he went on and was the first to document a gas exchange within the human lung and CO2, carbon dioxide, as a byproduct of respiration. So we now understand we're breathing in oxygen and we're exhaling carbon dioxide. He also went on to demonstrate that uh, respiration was a slow process of combustion. It was an oxidation process. And this led others to quickly postulate that oxygen could be toxic and cause lung congestion. Which I think, you know, given what they knew at the time, is quite a leap in imagination. But if this oxygen causes, you know, silver to tarnish, steel to turn to rust, well, perhaps too much of this oxygen is bad for us um, itself. So, and of course, that's proven to be the case. So now we, have, we understand that we're inhaling oxygen, we're exhaling this poisonous carbon dioxide. We can begin to think about some kind of regenerating breathing equipment now. And that concept came quickly thereafter. So Jan Ingehus, I believe he was a Dutchman, another famous scientist uh, who demonstrated photosynthesis in plants. Um, he then first proposed closed circuit regenerative breathing equipment. Let's, let's absorb this carbon dioxide, this poisonous stuff we exhale, and inhale some fresh oxygen. But it wasn't for about 70 years till something sort of tangible, practical sort of appeared on scene. And this is uh, an apparatus 
is by uh, designed by Professor Theodor Schwein, who I think was Swedish, Swiss. Clearly not intended for diving, um, but there was great interest in mine rescue at the time. A lot of uh, colliery and mine disasters going on, um, fire, smoke filled atmospheres, etc. So being able to breathe in these atmospheres was uh, was a sort of a big scientific quest. And then shortly thereafter, uh, another Frenchman, Paul Bay, he uh, he released um, a seminal piece of work, La Pressure and Barometrique. And in the studies, he demonstrated that oxygen toxicity is a function of oxygen partial pressure. And if you look at uh, some of the old literature, he's credited by uh, CMS oxygen toxicity being called the Paul Bear effect. And he determined that the toxic effect of oxygen is direct. It is as a consequence of metabolizing oxygen. Although we now know it's not the oxygen molecule per se, it's the byproducts of uh, the superoxides, the reactive oxygen species um, that actually uh, cause, cause the cell damage that result in oxygen toxicity. But it's it, as a consequence of met, uh, metabolizing oxygen. And no animal life is exempt. Everything from bacteria to more advanced life forms were all subject to the effects of high tensions of oxygen, um, oxygen pressures. And he also determined that the central nervous system was the first to be grossly affected, which was causing convulsions. And animal, animal trials were conducted to demonstrate this. At the same time, the English um, merchant officer, Henry, Henry Flaus, who you could I could probably sit to you and talk for another hour on just for just just him. Um, he was he was in India looking over the side of his merchant ship one day at these these divers using a hard hat system, standard diving dress, copper helmet, big suit, long hose, and thought there must be an easy way to do this. And he set about uh, designing his own free swimming auction diving equipment. And his second version was used to great success. A few years later, by a famous diver called Alexander Lambert, who managed to um, salvage the flooded uh, River Seven train tunnel, which was the biggest engineering, civil engineering project in Europe at the time. They hit a freshwater spring and uh, the whole thing flooded up. So they had to get a diver down there beyond the length of umbilical hoses to close uh, shutters to get the thing pumped out. And Mr. Lambert, did it on this prototype uh, oxygen rebreather. Again, a subject of another talk. So we have oxygen and we have diving now linked together. Trials and auction continued. Scotsman Lorraine Smith, James Lorraine Smith, um, he, he demonstrates pulmonary oxygen toxicity. And again, he's credited by it being called the Lorraine Smith effect in old literature. And he was finding that mice were dying after five hours at uh, three and a half atmospheres when breathing oxygen or PO2 at 3.5 atmospheres. He also suggested that uh, this could be broken or reduced by uh, taking air breaks and air intermissions. And that's a technique we still use today, both in uh, sort of hyperbaric oxygen treatment and during in-water oxygen uh, decompression acceleration, taking an air break. So moving on, 20th century, um, Henry Flaus collaborates with Robert Davis of the famous C.B. Gorman company, and they start to develop uh, oxygen rebreathers, principally for mine rescue, but also for submarine escape. And this is one of their earlier versions, an open hood oxygen rebreather escape system. And then in 1910, we have the first documented uh, case of um, humans being exposed to high oxygen partial pressures. This was the Elbe Tunnel, uh, a big civil engineering project. And um, to keep the tunnel dry, like most tunneling, it's, it's uh, pressurized. And there are two engineers, two engineers at 30, for 30 minutes with 90% oxygen, 95% oxygen. 
at uh, three atmospheres. So at about 2.85 bar. And they were fine, nothing wrong. So the development in auction reveals the submarine escape continues. We see here um, a Draeger version and a UK version, the Davis submarine escape operators. Interesting note, the Draeger one, you see there's an inhale and an exhale breathing hose. So we have the first breathing loop here. Uh, whereas uh, the UK one is a single breathing hose. So they're using uh, the technique called pendulum breathing. And during the 1920s, Draeger um, started advertising auction rebreathers for, for civilian lifeguard rescue use. And the use of uh, rebreathers was taken up in Italy for sports fear, uh, for sport uh, fishing, spear fishing. And this is quite pertinent. Uh, the use of auction rebreathers for, for diving in Italy came back to bite us, the British, uh, you know, uh, some 20 years later. So, so the process of development continues. This very neat looking apparatus for mine rescue uh, called the Proto. I throw it up here because even today the Royal Navy calls their, their CO2 absorbent Proto. And I don't know why they do that. And if somebody can tell me, I'd be really delighted. But I just wonder whether it's, whether it's a throwback from the 1930s and this 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 breathing equipment here pro called proto i have no idea but early research on auction continues for decompression purposes the royal navy were developing deep a deep diving capability so they're interested in accelerating the decompression by using in water uh, oxygen so in 1930 they had 12 subjects for an hour with an auction of 10 meters, a PO2 of two bar, no problem, no incidents reported. You also had four subjects for half an hour, with an auction of 20 meters, or a PO2 of three bar, with no reported incident. So this oxygen is not all that bad, eh? Two years later, Schilling and Adams, they can continue with experimentation on, ox on oxygen, and they, uh, they're using rats. And they note a marked tolerance variation between individual rats. A huge variation. And they proposed that early signs and symptoms would be recognized in man prior to convulsions occurring. They were only 50% right. 1933, again, the Royal Navy, Dammond and Phillips, 100% oxygen at four atmospheres. One of them experienced convulsive symptoms after 16 and then 13 minutes. Damon switched back to air and was okay. Phillips switched to air and he convulsed shortly afterwards. So we have the first documented case of what we call the off effect. That's where, despite you breathing a low oxygen partial pressure gas, the damage has been done, if you like. The injury is, the insult has occurred. And you just go, you're going to convulse anyway. The off effect. And Case and Haldane continue with this work, 100% oxygen at seven atmospheres. Now it makes me twitch just thinking of it. A PO2 of seven bar. So after four minutes, he's, he's experienced vertigo and malaise, just a general feel of unwell. He reverts back to air and is fine. So he thought, right, let's give it another go. Back onto oxygen at 60 meters. And muscle twitching after four minutes. So he reverted back to air. They start the ascent. They're in the decompression chamber, by the way. They start the ascent and the deco. And he convulsed 15 minutes later. Again, the off effect. Important to note this effect for later discussion. Jumping on, Arlene and Donald. 100% oxygen at 90 meters, 10 atmospheres for 30 seconds. PO2 of 10 bar. Whoa. Um, believed to be the highest human oxygen tension exposure. But why so deep? Because as we've seen, 
the means of escaping a sunken submarine was through the use of oxygen rebreathers. And the process to get from inside the submarine out into the surface means you've got to lock into the escape trunk, close the bottom hatch, flood that up, and then pressurize the remaining airspace as quickly as possible if you blow your eardrums too bad. Quickly go into the oxygen rebreather, open the top hatch, and up you go. So they needed to know how long they could be from going up the oxygen rebreather to opening the top hatch and getting to the surface or starting the ascent was the critical thing. How long a depth? And it's just minutes when we come to 200 or 300 feet or so they thought. But all of that or none of that was anything to do with uh, sort of offensive action or tactical diving. To talk about the use of uh, oxygen rebreathers for, if you like, combat diving, we have to go back to World War One. And during World War One, uh, Italy was allied with the UK and France. And its main adversary was the Hungo Austro Hungarian Empire. And uh, its fleet was lay well protected in various harbors. And the Italians had tried numerous occasions to attack the fleet at anchor with limited success. But one of the most innovative approaches was the development of the slow surface running torpedo. And they had two swimmers would ride astride of this torpedo. And it would run in, they could maneuver it over the top of the boom net defenses surrounding the harbor, surrounding the battleship, and then point the torpedo and let it, let it go. And of course, uh, jump off at the opportune moment. And literally days before the, the, um, the ceasefire, World War I ceasefire, they launched an attack on one of their main battleships. And they managed to sink a battleship at anchor. And also a large, large freighter, the Veen. So that's two guys and a torpedo managed to sink a battleship. Well, a couple of days later, World War I, or the armistice at least, at least was called, and the, the shooting stopped. So kind of world events took over. So I suspect the significance of that attack was lost on naval intelligence in the UK in particular, because this was going to come back to halt us in the next war. So moving on between the wars, complete change of status politically within Europe. And Mussolini, uh, fascist Italy allies with Hitler. And uh, the Italians realized they're going to be facing the British in the Mediterranean at some point. Um, but they had a very limited uh, surface fleet. So they were open to all sorts of ideas, innovative ideas of how to, how to, uh, um, to execute uh, war. And as a consequence, two submarine engine officers took up the idea of the surface running torpedo. Uh, and their own initiative and applied this to use underwater. And in doing so, they developed um, long endurance breathing equipment, oxygen breathing equipment to do this. So in the 1930s, in complete secrecy, unknown to anybody, the Italians developed the free swimming combat diver and the wet combat submersible or swim and delivery vehicle. And that development, during that development, they refined the slow running torpedo so it could be controlled underwater using compressed air for buoyancy tanks. They increased the range to four to five miles and the speed to about four knots. They carried tools on board for cutting, uh, cutting uh, buoyancy, uh, sorry, um, boom protection nets um, that guard uh, harbors against torpedo or submarine incursion. So all this work was done in complete secrecy. And they carried a pretty potent warhead, or two of them, 150 kilograms TNT. And in conjunction with that, separately, they developed the free swimming combat frogman, if you like, and the gamma force, as they were called. All of this with a view to being able to, when ready, to start attacking British shipping in the Mediterranean. And they made some significant technological adv advancements. Like I say, long endurance oxygen rebreathers, which ironically were made in Italy under license from Dunlop in the UK. Um, but they 
put an extra cylinder on and made a bigger canister. They made very nice lightweight dry suits and a nice suite of specialist diving instruments, Panerai uh, dive watches, depth gauges, compasses, torches, and diving knives that double up as adjustable wrenches and spanners and uh, you know screwdrivers. Along with that, the ordnance, the weapons needed to attack shipping, photograph here of a free swimming diver. He's clamping a, a charge onto the bilge keel of, of, a, of, a, of a ship uh, doing a training exercise here for the 1930s. And a similar method of attack was used and developed by the, the charioteers. As you can see, they'd approach one side of the target vessel, they'd use a G-clamp, they secure a line to one of the bilge keels. They'd run that line across to the other side, to the other bilge keel, attach another G clamp, and then they'd suspend from that one of the nose cones of the actual um, torpedo or uh, mialis, the pigs as they used to call them, because they were pig to handle, and they must have been a pig to handle. And they'd leave hanging under the target vessel then uh, 150 kilograms of explosives set on a timing detonator. Now, these Italians were pretty good swimmers by all accounts, but they were never gonna get from Italy to Gibraltar doing the, doing the front crawl. Um, so you had to deliver them there. So in military speak, delivery of, delivery of effect. How did they do that? Again, a decade ahead of anybody, they developed dry deck shelters. That's the term used today, dry deck hangers or dry deck shelters. And inside these, they would store the, the, the torpedoes, the, the man torpedoes, the Miali. And they would transport those into, into theatre. And then at the suitable tactical range from the target, they put the submarine on the, on the seabed in shallow water. The actual attack divers would lock out the submarine. They'd flood up the dry shelters, open the hatch, pull out the Miali, close the hatches, shut everything down, and then off they would go on their operation to attack British shipping. And they conducted numerous successful attacks on British ships um, off Gibraltar using this method until eventually British intelligence um, got to know how what was going on. And then it became too risky to take the submarine into such shallow water. So new methods of attack had to be devised. And to give you a feel, an idea of, of you know, what, what, what they were up to, this I think is a piece of, uh, sort of documentary from the 60s, I think. And it's just giving you a flavor for, for what they did. So again, these, these net boom protections would be over the mouth of harbor entrances. And they'd be open period periodically, of course, to let in shipping. Otherwise, these uh, these would be closed. So those had to be uh, penetrated, either by going beneath them or by cutting in through them. Once they penetrated the harbour, select your target, and then underneath. And you can see in the nose of this Miali here, the eye bolt. That's where the actual explosive charge is suspended from underneath the target uh, the target vet ship. And to be honest, the, the, the basic fundamental attack technique or tactic hasn't changed. So in World War II, the Italians had that capability. And even today, only a, literally a handful of countries have such a capability now. On the right here, we're looking at the US Navy submarine with two large dry deck shelters on the back for SDVs. The US being one of a handful of countries who, like I said, has this capability. So it, it, was, it was a huge um, sort of capability development. So that brings us into World War II. And by 1941, so Britain and Western Europe was alone against uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, fortunately, uh, Germany had invaded, made that strategic mistake of invading Russia. Otherwise, I suspect I'd be speaking to you tonight in German with a Welsh accent, which is an interesting thought. But um, suddenly in 1941, when Italy got underway, 
the UK was attacked by this completely unknown form of maritime warfare. And Britain was ill-prepared to defend itself or to, or to try and prosecute this kind of warfare. It just didn't know what was going on initially. All because the Italians were so successful in their secrecy and maintaining um, absolute secrecy of, of, of that capability they, they developed. And our main bases, British bases in the Mediterranean, were Gibraltar, Malta, and Alexandria in Egypt. And in 41, after a previous unsuccessful attempt, when the Italian uh, submarines dropped off three Miali, that's with six men, and they penetrated into, um, into um, Alexandra Harbour, Harbour. And they managed to sink two battleships, the Valiant and the Queen Elizabeth. They sank them at their berth. And they also, and this, this is uh, the damage of one of them. And I think what I'm looking at, or what we're looking at, uh, the hard line at the top of the photograph, I think, is the bottom of the armor belt. If anybody's dived on a battleship, and I've fortunately dived on a few, um, it, it's hard to judge the scale. But if, if that is the bottom of the armor belt, then if you duck your head, you can walk into that hole. So that's the damage that was done. And they were at their berth, so the water was shallow, so they just settled on the, on the seabed. And the British tried to hide the fact that these, these battleships were out of action. And they also sunk uh, a destroyer and uh, a large tanker. And it was considered uh, the greatest strategic strike in the Mediterranean theater. Think about it. Six guys fought out two battleships, plus a destroyer. Overnight, um, the UK, the Allies had lost uh, control of the Mediterranean. Six guys did that. All the actual Italian combat swimmers were captured. Um, and there's a nice twist to the tale here. Um, one of the captains of, I think it was uh, Queen Elizabeth, um, later in the war, he ended up uh, pinning to the chest uh, the, the Italian equivalent of the Victoria Cross to one of the divers who'd sunk his ship. Because by that time, the Italians had joined, uh, joined forces with the British and we were actually running joint, joint underwater operations together. So it's, it's, it's really quite a nice twist to the tale. But as you can imagine, a certain prime minister is rather annoyed. So right into a chief of staff, quoting Churchill, please report what is being done to emulate the exploits of the Italians in Alexandria Harbour and similar methods of this kind. Is there any reason why we should be incapable of the same kind of scientific aggressive action. One would have thought that we should have been in the lead. Please state exact position. Now you can you can you read between the lines that you know Mr. Churchill is deeply uh, deeply annoyed. So how did the Navy respond? Well, first of all, we had to try and defend ourselves against this this form of warfare. So in Gibraltar, they got two volunteers initially, and they used the submarine Davis Escape auction rebreather, and they gave them one day training. Just one day of training. And their job was every ship that came into uh, Gibraltar, uh, as soon as it went to anchor, they went, out, they went underneath and they did a bottom search, both at day and night. This is where using oxygen rebreathers, the swimming trunks and their plimsolls. And if anybody's dived in Gibraltar, you'll know that it's not particularly warm. A cold Atlantic gushes in through the straits there uh, with some very strong currents and the water is very cold. So day or night, that's what their job was to do. And every now and then they would come across a limpet mine like you can see here. And every now and then they come across something larger. 150 kilograms of TNT on a timing device waiting to go bang at any minute. So an unenviable job, to say the least. We then joined uh, by uh, the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Officer Buster, Buster Crab, Royal Navy, 
and uh, he's subject to, to you know, uh, many a talk himself. A point to note is uh, that this one day training there, uh, oxygen rebreather, it didn't include telling them that they had to change the carbon dioxide scrubber. So they were diving for days and days. Before eventually, somebody else turned up, I think it was a submariner, and, 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 and pointed out that they need to change this uh, CO2 absorbent after every dive. So, in terms of trying to prosecute this kind of warfare to replicate um, this capability, there was a call out to the armed forces for hazardous duties. And so we started to develop this capability. Basically, we tried to copy the Italians. We captured a few uh, chariots by this time, Miali's, and they were sent off to the UK and we started to replicate the designs. And we started to develop our own long endurance oxygen diving, diving rebreathers, heavy duty suits specifically uh, for use with the chariots as they were called in the UK. And also started to look at modifying submarines the same as the Italians. So we were playing catch up. Concurrent with that, similar to the Italians, um, Royal Marine and Royal Navy free swimming frogmen teams are being trained on a variety of roles, um, including, um, you know, direct action attack to clearing uh, beach obstacles or amphibious landings, D-Day being in, being in mind at this, even at this early stage. And of course, transportation means to get people there, which is what was called the Sleeping Beauty. And uh, there's actually a modern variant of that uh, on the market uh, today, uh, one of the companies I work with. And what was the uh, UK's main tar target? Well, it was the battleship, the German battleship Tirpitz. Now, her sister ship, the Bismarck, she'd already been sunk out in the, into the, into the, in the Atlantic. The Royal Navy had thrown everything at her to sink the Bismarck after the Bismarck put one shell into the HMS Hood off, uh, off Iceland and uh, sent 800 odd sailors to their grave. Um, so that left the Tirpitz and she was holed up in the northern Norwegian fjords and uh, presented a significant risk in the northern uh, sort of North Atlantic to convoys coming across from the US and were keeping basically. UK alive. And the program to attack the turbids um, was the development of the X Crafts mini submarines, little four man submarines. But this program was behind. So they, they, they uh, attempted to use the, the chariots to attack the turbids, and a couple of attempts were made and successfully. But during this whole training period, there was unforeseen oxygen toxicity problems. And they weren't sure why. They weren't sure what was going on because the charioteers were not at depths where they thought oxygen was going to be a problem. And if you look at the oxygen sort of uh, tolerance limits at that time, here's the Royal Navy Oxygen Submarine Escape Handbook. According to the handbook, you could do 60 minutes at 100 feet. That's 30 meters. 60 minutes at a pure two or four bar. Six minutes at 200 feet, 60 minutes. They thought you could three minutes at 300 feet. So why are people having problems down at, at 50 odd feet? We don't understand it. Let's look at the UK and the, the US Navy inward auction decompression tables from that time. They thought you could do two hours at 50 feet, 15 meters. Two hours at a PO2 of two and a half bar. Why are we having a problem if that's if you can do that? You can do 30 minutes at 90 feet, according to the understanding of oxygen at the time. Clearly, something was not right. So they were having charities um, having oxygen toxicity fits in the water. And if you've not seen one of those, which is quite disconcerting, there's a piece of footage from the 1940s of British uh, charities. I've only seen an oxygen toxicity fit once while diving. It was after leaving a submarine in the North Sea, and we'd be down on oxygen for too long. And it's about 13 meters for 20 minutes, for, for reasons I shan't bore you with. But uh, as soon as uh, we left the submarine, started working hard, uh, one of the divers had an immediate CNS oxygen toxicity fit. 
and um, you know, with 150 meters of water beneath you in the black of night, when somebody has a fit in front of you, it's uh, yeah, disconcerting to say the least. So here's a couple, couple of Royal Marines here um, preparing uh, an oxygen rebreather for free swimming, and there's another charioteer with long, long enduring cylinders worn on the back. And like the Italians, we'd put them on the back. And this piece of next piece of footage is actually from the 1950s. It's US Navy. And this is uh, some auction toxicity expense that the US Navy did afterwards. And you can see that the subject is strapped down his shoulders, his hands, his legs are strapped down. And if you haven't seen a toxicity hit, well, this is what it looks like. Rather unpleasant, to say the least. Big run mal convulsion. So the Royal Navy, Royal Navy needed to better understand what was going on with oxygen at depth. So another call for hazard, to hazardous duties was made. And a lot of volunteers were selected for human trials. So they were taught how to use a basic oxygen rebreather in a submarine escape tank. And uh, as we said, Lieutenant Surgeon Donald was chosen to run the trials. And these trials were conducted at the C.B. Gorman factory near Portsmouth because it had all the sort of uh, recompression facilities there for use. So it's taken a while to get there, but that was the background to the trials themselves. And so now hopefully you, you better appreciate what was driving these experiments and the extremity of what you're, we're about to discuss. So first of all, they had to set a benchmark. Let's throw away everything we know, or we believe we know. Let's start again and set a benchmark. Let's go to 90 feet in the dry so that observers can record any signs they witness, and then, and then trial subject can record any symptoms he experiences. So that's signs and symptoms. You observe a sign, you experience a symptom. So that was the first series. So they went to 90 feet in the dry. So breathing oxygen, that'd be uh, 3.7 bar. The, they had 37 individuals. And it quickly became apparent that there was enormous variation between these individuals. Some people were experiencing symptoms after six minutes, while others would go on for an additional hour and a half without experiencing anything. Hmm. A bit like the rats, you know, 15 years earlier. Huge variation. And Donald developed this concept of a 50% survival time. This was in it to enable sort of operational risk to be uh, de determined. And the survival time, 50% survival time was a time by which 50% of the trial subject experienced um, marked symptoms of oxygen toxicity. So you can see here, by 22 minutes, 50% of the, the subject were experiencing oxygen toxicity symptoms. However, within and around this time, five of them had convulsed. At 19, 26, 30, 32, and 33 minutes, um, so some people running for an hour and a half and nothing, some people were convulsing after 19 minutes. This is just a huge variation. So if we go back to our uh, Royal Navy oxygen decompression table, what was, what did we think we could do at 90 feet? Well, we thought we could do 30 minutes. Well, as we just discussed in and around 30 minutes, we were having people convulse. So clearly that was wrong. And bear in mind, the trials at this point are in the dry and the significance of this we'll come to it in a little, a little later. So clear that that in water decompression table is completely wrong. If we go to the similar escape table, 
Well, they thought they could do 60 minutes at 100 feet. Well, let's look what happens. What happened after 60 minutes? 90% of the trial subjects were experiencing oxygen toxicity problems. So clearly, that table is wrong. I'm not sure why there's such a discrepancy between these tables. Um, you'd think they would be very similar, possibly because of different branches of the Navy were doing their own sort of thing and came up with different solutions. But, but there it is. The point being, previously reported exposure times at this depth were grossly incorrect and extremely dangerous. No wonder the charioteers were experiencing oxygen toxicity problems during training when we're down to 50, 60 feet. So having set a benchmark at 90 feet in the dry, it was time to move on into the wet. So let's quote uh, one of the test divers, uh, Sidney Woolcott. The pot was a diabolical contraption, a pressure chamber six feet in diameter. That is where our trouble started. We were told we might be knocked out, and if not surface quickly, could die. So that's the, if you like, your, your terms of reference. Um, you volunteered for something, this is this, there's your terms of reference, guys. Let's crack on. So the wet pot itself, uh, pressure chamber, as you can see, uh, with partially flooded about uh, two thirds of the way up. And there's a photograph looking down into that pot with the attendant. The attendant sits on a bench wearing waders, rubber waders, with his legs into the water. And the actual test diver is lowered in on a harness and a, and a pulley. And the chamber sealed up. And the test divers we breathe a flush through onto oxygen pressurized and off he goes. So there's a bit of the actual uh, dive control, the top side. And here's a photograph of an actual unconscious diver being hauled out of the pot, having just convulsed as a consequence of oxygen toxicity. He's craned out, laid down on the deck, and then his buddy steps up to have his go. So, having done these baseline dry trials at 90 feet, as I said, we're now going into the pot, a wet pot. Uh, and for the first time, we're doing the wet dive. So, you can picture the scene, can't you? There are 30 men lined up, and the diving officer asks for a volunteer to go first. 29 men step backwards, and that leaves poor Simmerton standing alone. First dive, Simmerton. He's going to go to 50 feet for 30 minutes. After 25 minutes, panic stations up, up, up. The pot was lowered to zero, so they depressurized the pot, that's what they mean. And Simmerton was hauled out unconscious. That's the very first wet dive. And now it's your turn. Who's next? So they proceed with the trials. And the protocol at this stage was, as I said, 50 feet, two and a half atmospheres, breathing oxygen, a PO2 of 2.5 bar. The temperature of water was kept at 18 degrees C, so not too warm, not too cold, you know, fairly comfortable. And the, the protocol, pre dive protocol, the diver would go onto the rebreather, would flush it through to get rid of excess air or nitrogen. And then from there on, there would be a constant flow of oxygen into the rebreather at 1.2 liters a minute to keep it flushed out to, to get as, as close to 100% oxygen into the rebreather as is possible. And this whole process took about 10, 10 minutes from going onto the rebreather to getting down to pressure or being on bottom, as it's termed. So about 10 minutes. So the divers were coming from a nomoxic environment, as we are now breathing air down to these high parcel pressures. And this is, this is a point to note for later discussion. So they conduct 100 dives um, at this, pro, this, this profile. 
and the day was terminated at 30 minutes or if somebody experienced convulsive symptoms. And the divers were not exercising. That's, it. That's it. again, important to note at this point. They were wet, submerged, but they were not exercising. And during these dives, 28% convulsed. From anything from seven minutes exposure to 29 minutes. Significant amount, over 25% were convulsing. And they weren't exercising. 21% were experiencing lip twitching after 10 to 30 minutes. However, on the flip side of that coin, 51% experienced no symptoms during a 30 minute exposure. Wow. You know, massive variation. So, having completed that series of trials and captured that data, they went, into, went on to dive deeper. This was in the wet, but resting. And they noticed short, short survival, 50 percent survival times. At 100 feet, it was five minutes. So at 30 meters on oxygen, by five minutes, 50% of the trial subject had experienced oxygen toxicity symptoms. At 50 feet, it was 25 minutes. So the 50% survival time decreased by approximately five minutes for every 10 foot of depth increase as a kind of general rule of thumb. So having got to that stage, the then Surgeon, Surgeon Lieutenant Donald uh, um, starts to draw some conclusions. Um, it becomes clear that to judge even a single man's tolerance by one or even several dives is dangerous and unjustifiable. If we examine the three, di three divers who survived for 100 minutes of 50 feet, which is a PO2 of two and a half bar, we find the average of all their other performances at this depth is 22, 19, and 15 minutes, respectively. So one day they went for 100 minutes and at 50 feet. Another day, they're having symptoms, marked symptoms of toxicity at 15 minutes. So they went, then moved on. What's the effect of, uh, of, of rest? Um, uh, in the dry against being under pressure at rest. So they had the baseline, the first set of trials we discussed, 90 feet in the dry. What happens if you go to 90 feet wet? What happens? Well, the 50% survival time is halved. It's halved just by the mere fact of being underwater. Your, your tolerance is reduced by 50%. So you can see here against these graphs, there's survival time, 50% survival time with 22 minutes in the dry and 11 minutes in the wet. And during this period, as we discussed, um, separately, free swimming, frogmen uh, diving teams were being trained. And they were experiencing shallow water blackout in very shallow water where there should not have been oxygen toxicity problems. And again, they just did not understand what was going on. So Donald was tasked with doing some trials to measure the actual oxygen consumption of a free swimming diver. And, you know, to his own admission, much to his surprise when it shouldn't have been a surprise, uh, the oxygen consumption rates were significantly higher than anticipated. They vary from two and a half to four liters a minute um, consumption, which means the divers are producing approximately two and a half to four liters of CO2 per minute. Why? Because the large leg muscles were liberated um, and were now in use. Um, so we've got greater CO2 production going on and Basically, the guys were knocking themselves out with CO, with CO2 poisoning. And there were some very serious accidents and a couple of fatal as a consequence of inadequate CO2 elimination because they just did not anticipate such, such rates of CO2 generation. So they had to quickly go to the drawing board, back to the drawing board, and design new 
new oxygen rebreathers with bigger canisters, specifically for free swimming divers. So we've, we've now got data on comparing wet and dry. Let's come get some data now comparing wet at rest and wet at work. Does working underwater make a difference to your oxygen tolerance? Let's see. They went back to 50 feet and they had then a strict protocol of work. Instead of standing there doing nothing, the diver had to undertake a con continuous set of exercises. And lo and behold, the 50% survival time was further halved, reduced again by another 50%. So there was a, a realization that free swimming divers were at significant risk at depth thought previously acceptable. And then they looked that uh, okay we're going to operate all around the world what what effect does water temperature have so standard temperature as i mentioned was 18 degrees c so they then did some trials at 31 degrees c and at 9 degrees c and it was found that on average this also reduced the 50 percent survival rate not by much five minutes or so but it it appears that High warm water and low, low temperature cold water has an effect on your oxygen tolerance. So that needs to be accounted for if you're going to plan worldwide operations. And by now it was apparent that not only was there a significant difference between individual um, test divers, but each individual test diver on a day to day basis appeared to have. A, a different tolerance variation. So the trials focused begin began to focus in on that. So they selected a particular diver who was deemed to have good tolerance. And unlucky for him, they dived in twice a week for the next three months. And they kept the depth at um, 3.1 atmospheres and the water temperature at 18 degrees C. And it was, uh, he was no exercise, he was at rest. He used the same breathing equipment, the same diving dress, and they kept the daily timings consistent. And you can see from that particular diver's curves here, um, the huge variation from the onset of um, significant symptoms of CNS toxicity. So over 90 days, the variation was massive. One day, seven minutes to another day, 148 minutes. And this is this particular diver's curve, tolerance curve over that period. And looking through the data, um, there was just no consistency between divers. Some divers' tolerance would, would, would remain as it was for days, weeks even, and then spike slightly, then drop back down to near enough its original level. Other, other divers' tolerance would sort of slowly increase over time. Others would increase in stages, peak, then drop back. And others would just decrease continually over a set period of time. There was just no pattern nothing consistent at all to enable you to, to draw hard, firm, safe diving limits. But they had to be made. There's a war on. There were operations that need to be, needed to be conducted. So if you look at uh, one individual and his particular tolerance variation, he did 12 minutes of 50 feet. And then convulsed. PO2 2.5 bar. 16 days later, 100 minutes at 50 feet, and he had no symptoms. All was well. Six days later, after 32 minutes, he convulsed again. So, significant variation. 
significant variation between divers, between individuals, and between you as an individual diver, inter and intra diver tolerance, hugely variable. And this was a complete revelation. So the old auction diving limitation tables had to be thrown away. So if you go back to Sydney, uh, Sydney Walcott, one of the test divers, again quoting him, I had been down, I'd been down at 50 feet for 20 minutes when I felt the first twitching of my lips. At 30 minutes, I suddenly felt a violent twitching of my lips. This became a definite pain and my lips became distorted as if my mouth was being stretched. I tried to climb the ladder, but my whole back was convulsing. I fell back, blackness closed in. So that's Sydney's description of an auction toxicity blackout. And he went through that numerous times. After that, he called to the surface, as we've seen, um, looked over by the doctor, give him a cup of tea, and give him the next day off. The following day, you're back on the trials again. That was the routine. So we mentioned twitching a lot as a symptom, and it it, it featured uh, you know predominantly, um, along with uh, then nausea, dizziness, convulsions. Numbness and tingling, visual disturbances, disturbances to hearing, uh, headaches, etc. So, in total, 2,170 dives were undertaken. And what, during 1,212 of those dives, toxicity symptoms were, experiencing, were experienced. Half the convuls convulsions occurred without any pre monetary symptoms. There was nothing to tell you you're gonna you were about to convulse. No sign that somebody could identify, no symptoms for you to actually spot yourself. So, you know, those of you who have been rebreather trained or nitrox trained, you know, you 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 get uh, your education on oxygen toxicity and whatever mnemonic you use to try and remember the signs and symptoms. Um my 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 preferred one is the uh, center dive. Convented is another common one. Um, but this is where they come from. Those trials back in uh, the, the 1940s. So, some conclusions then by Donald. So, variability of the group is independent of depth. The variation of symptoms even in the same individual, and at times their complete absence before convulsions, constitute a grave menace to the independent oxygen diver. The variation of tolerance between individuals, the variation of tolerance of each individual, the impairment of tolerance with work and underwater, all make diving on pure oxygen below 25 feet a hazardous gamble. So that was the output from that study. And that really defines, uh, you know, auction combat diving still to this day. Although we do, uh, we are, are increasingly becoming a little bit more conservative as our understanding of other factors that influence auction toxicity have increased. So, what is the relevance uh, of all of this to today? You know, this happened, you know, well, um, you know, nearly eighty years ago. Is it relevant? Well, of course it is. Particularly to us using rebreathers. Particularly us using constant PO2, oxygen uh, electronically controlled rebreathers. Right? Our oxygen exposure using electronically controlled rebreathers is, is higher compared to diving, um, say, mechanical nitrox rebreathers or nitrox open circuit because we're maintaining a constant partial pressure throughout the dive and it's generally relatively high you know 1.3 being a common oxygen set point and that usually starts at the early stage of the dive around about by the time you get to 15 meters and remains at that until the dive is completed whereas if you dive in nitrox mechanical rebreathers the deepest part of the dive is your highest oxygen exposure and when you come shallow, the PO2 decreases with depth, therefore your oxygen exposure decreases with depth. So your oxygen exposure overall is less. So 
we must be mindful of this. If we're using constant PO2 rebreathers, we have a relatively high oxygen exposure. So we should be mindful of this. You know, extended exposures. Keep the maximum set point at 1.3. Right. And then there's, you know, there's a case to be made to, to even uh, have it even lower, say 1.2, you know, maybe semantics, 1.3, 1.2. Point is, the long exposures don't exceed 1.3. We've got a good, you know, we've got 20 years of this now. So 1.3 seems to be a, a reasonably safe, safe uh, level for extended diving. However, if you're on a working dive, so whether that be a long cave penetration, um, some kind of scientific dive, um, anywhere where you're working, think about reducing your PO2 set point. Of course, the downside of that is you're, you're increasing your, your inert gas exposure and therefore your decompression. And that's always the conundrum, isn't it? That's the paradox between all of this. Try to balance oxygen and inert gas exposure. So when we eventually do get to our decompression, don't elevate it above 1.6 for sure. Um, and you know, as a general recommendation, if you're going to do it, if you're going to elevate the PO2 to try and accelerate your decompression, you know, keep it to 1.4 at the top end. I've uh, I've just uh, you know read an accident report by a diver who was uh, well known for. Uh, ex uh, injecting oxygen into his breathing loop uh, when he left bottom to try to accelerate his decompression and he would frequently reach PO2s of 2.5 bar. Uh, we, we've already seen the effect of that. Well, guess what happened to that, that diver? Yeah, oxygen toxicity hit, lost consciousness, drowned. So, civilian sport diving. PO2 exposure tables. Typically, we follow the NOAA um, tables and stay as far as you can within these. Sometimes you can't. You know, expedition diving requires you to go beyond these things. And you have to understand what you're doing if you're going to do this and try and take mitigation if you're going to do it. But if you come across expect exceptional exposure limits on the internet, just ignore them, guys. All right. Stick with the standard exposure limits, all right, they've got a good safety track record, remain with them. If you stumble upon ex extended exposures, exceptional exposures, don't think uh, these are necessarily safe to use. You've all now hopefully understand why they may not be. And then you frequently come across people that will argue, well, you know, the, you, you go to 18 meters on oxygen in a recompression chamber, I got the bends and I was on a, a, at 18 meters uh, breathing oxygen. I was fine. It doesn't count, guys. We've all, and we, we now understand the difference between being in the dry and being submerged. So it just doesn't apply to us. All right. All right. Exercise. As we noted, going from the dry to the wet reduced uh, your tolerance by approximately 50%. And exercising in the wet reduces by a further 50%. So if you're going to be exercising or try and do as much as you can to reduce any, any work rate. Like I say, reduce your set point on working dives. Use trimix deeper than 30 meters. Particularly rebreather divers. It's, it's, it's relatively cheap, you know. We're recirculating the gas. Doesn't cost much. Different if you're open circuit, but um, you know, um, we now have a far greater understanding of the impact of CO2 on oxygen toxicity. So reducing work rate is very important. Um, and if you look at this graph here, I used it on my last talk. Some of you may remember it. This is the reduction in ventilation with depth. And you can see your ventilation is reduced by approximately 50% by the time you get to 100 feet or 30 meters. However, our ability to produce CO2 is still the same at 30 meters or at any depth. Our ability to get rid of it is reduced markedly. So 
when we're diving, we are to at all stages of the dive, we are retaining a certain amount of CO2. And CO2 is a vasodilator. It, it increases blood flow to the brain significantly. Um, and that's probably why there's a big difference between being in the dry and being in the wet. Because in the wet, you have to use a breathing system, a breathing apparatus, a rebreather. And all the extra resistive effort that that increases probably results in retained CO2 to a certain degree, which probably results in the delivery of additional oxygen to the brain, hence the reduction in oxygen tolerance so the use of trimix um, is recommended you know if i've got it i use it any depth keeps the breathing makes the breathing easier part of that reducing work rate is optimizing your buoyancy trim and we all it's a constant we all constantly trying to work at this and you know when you get it and you're perfectly horizontal and you're perfectly neutrally buoyant you know you're at that point because you glide one simple kick and you can feel it you just glide you come off the horizontal by in a small amount and that that sensation of gliding is just goes and use a piece of scientific data to verify that if you come off the horizontal by just 10 degrees you can see your drag increases by 30 percent approximately how many how many of us are swimming at uh, 10 degrees off the horizontal Probably most people with over the shoulder kind of lungs. If you come off the horizontal 20 degrees, you can see your drag now increases by 130%. And how many people do you see swimming around on rebreathers at a 20 degree angle? I, I see a significant amount of people. So focus on your buoyancy and trim. It's a key skill, as we all know. But the impact to reducing your, your, your breathing rate and your work rate is significant. If you can afford it and you work and you dive in extreme situations, high tidal flows, deep wrecks, etc., get a DPV. Okay. And get towed around by a machine. Keep your work of breathing down, keep your work rate down. All right. Um, and it increases your safety significantly. So deep diving. In, in, in uh, high flow, condi water flow conditions, tides, etc., DPV is absolutely recommended. And if you do an extended diving, you know, day after day after day, you know, you've got a truck lagoon of a Kini Atoll for two weeks. Well, you're only there maybe once in a lifetime. You're going to kick the ass out of it. You're going to be in the water two, three times a day, maybe doing two hour dives each dive. So keep track of your exposure. It's easy these days, isn't it? Our computers are doing it for us, but keep an eye on it. And after a week or so, think about lowering your PO2. Think about taking maybe at least half a day off. Yeah. So again, you hear people on the internet, and I've long ago given up, uh, you know, engaging on internet forums with diving. Um, my patience and willingness to live sort of went away so but you come across people now and then combat divers use 100 percent oxygen repeaters at six meters for hours what's wrong with that uh, with me with, with me it being a six meters uh 100 oxygen it doesn't count guys uh, first point is it, it's, it's never 100 percent oxygen in a in a in a rebreather in a, an oxygen rebreather and the flush processes doesn't get there in fact the U.S. Navy process is deliberately designed not to get to 100% oxygen or even close to it, so that there's a amount of nitrogen padding in the breathing gas to reduce the possibility of oxygen toxicity. So they're not breathing 100% oxygen at six meters for four hours. So it doesn't count. And you say, oh, I found on the internet these combat diver depth exposure, um, depth excursion limits. They don't count, guys. These are for operational reasons. Uh, you have to face a choice. Imagine you're a combat diver, you're swimming at four meters, you penetrate in the harbor, and you hear a big, big noise. And it gets noisier and noisier. You've got a choice. Stay at that depth, surface, or go deep so the ship goes over the top of you. And I haven't had to do it twice. I'd rather take my chances and go deep than run the risk of getting chopped up in some 
ship's propeller. So that's what that they they're primarily there for. Right? The quick excursion down in extreme situation where you may have to. They're not routine in any way, shape, or form. They don't apply. Yeah, people say, oh, in water oxygen decompression, militaries are using it from eight to fifteen meters. And they are. But it still doesn't apply to us. Okay. Here's a set of uh, French trimix tables here. Um, just as a sideline, the French are the only Navy that use Trimix. They've been using it very successfully since the uh, well, late 70s, both in open circuit and uh, mecha uh, mechanical to semi-closed circuit rebreathers. And if we look at, uh, if you can see it, we look at, uh, let's say, an 80 meter dive. And for 15 minutes, a very short bottom times, and they're going to pull. All the way back to fifty to fifteen meters, do three minutes there on the trimix, and then at twelve meters they're going to start breathing oxygen from a, a hooker demand valve dropped in the water. That's their procedure. So they're breathing oxygen at uh, twelve meters, a PO two of two point two. But for operational reasons, again, militaries have to accept. A higher PO2 exposure. Um, if you're in a minefield, you want to get out of the minefield quite quickly. You don't need really hanging around decompressing, so you want to get out of the water as early as possible. If there's a problem, 500 meters away, away there's a mine hunter with a recompression chamber in it. And if you do get bent, you, you're quickly pressed into that, and you'll finish your decompression in the in, in the recompression chamber. So it's a completely different scenario. So the bottom times are short, as I said, and there's a lot of risk mitigation. The use of full face masks or diving helmets if they're using surface supply type equipment. If they do go unconscious, have an oxygen toxicity fit, the airway is going to be better protected. Generally, the divers will be tended. It'll be on a line to the surface. They may have calms. As I said, there'll be an on-site recompression chamber literally minutes away. They've got a lot of personnel there whose sole job it is, is to support the diver. That's all they do for the day. Whether it be the safety diver, whether it be the attendant, whether it be the various deck hands, they're there to support the, hot, the diver in the water. We don't have that as sport, we'd be the technical divers. We're by ourselves fundamentally. And also, Emergent procedures are well rehearsed and these rehearsals are frequently executed. And it's something I do when I'm away training dive teams. The first or second dive of the training course, a full unconscious diver recovery procedure is executed from getting the man out of the water from decompression stop to getting him right transported right to the decompression chamber and into the chamber ready to press him. That exercise is conducted before that train before the rest of the training training continues. Similar thing when I'm running expeditions, technical diving expeditions. One of the early dives will there'll be a full diver recovery procedure, so that everybody understands what that process is and what's required, where the safety equipment is, who's doing what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the military do this as a matter of course. So we spoke about the daily tolerance uh, intra-variability. Right? It varies hugely. So getting away with something one day is no assurance you will another day. As that diver I just spoke about um, found out, much to his family's clearly regret. He's away now. He has no regrets. It's his family that are left. So that's who we have to think about, the people who are left behind. Accelerate, accel trying to accelerate your decompression by pumping your PO2 up to 2.5 after a deep wreck dive. Are you insane? Absolute madness. And he paid the ultimate price for it. Be aware of different medication. This too has a reduced uh, a reduction on your oxygen uh, tolerance. Now, if you are running expeditions to remote locations, the likes of Truck Lagoon, where there won't be a, a, a functional operational recompression chamber, 
or Bikini Atoll, you, you may be days away from a chamber. So if you're running expeditions, you, you, you really need to be thinking of what you could do if something does go wrong. And there, there are in-water recompression protocols you come across. And if you are an expedition diving safety officer, you may have to be thinking of, of, of undertaking these if required. But if you do, you need to understand the issues of putting a man back in the water. If it's your only choice, okay, it may be your only choice. Okay, with agreement, of course, of the distressed diver. But um, you need to, you know, think about the use of full face masks in case there is a, a toxicity event. You need to have him tended from the surface. It needs to be on a line, and somebody needs to be holding that line continually, and the end of that line secured inboard to the boat or the dock side. If you're going to do it, do it in shallow, sheltered water where there's less stress on the diver from current or sea swell, preferably um, on the dock side, if you can do it. Get somebody in the water with that diver throughout the whole dive, throughout the whole procedure. You have to swap divers out, then do so. But make sure that the diver being treated in the water has somebody at hand immediately to assist. And if this forms part of your expedition protocol, as I said, one of your first dives, that's, you have to run through this procedure and fully execute it. From recovering somebody to going through the process of assessment, to putting them onto the equipment, getting them into the water and breathing oxygen at 30 feet or nine meters. I need to go through the whole scent procedure, but get to that stage. So everybody knows what the process is in your team, in your expedition. So convulsions, as we said, 50% of them occurred with no warning. So if you're in remote, well, very remote locations, I, I, I have a habit of doing whenever I can. Tip yourself to your delayed SMB or to your trees. Just run a small jump line across. Use a bailout valve. So if you do experience any symptoms at all, you can quickly go to a lower PO2 gas. There's no guarantee nothing's going to happen. We've already discussed the off effect. But at least it means you can go to another breathing gas without taking a mouthpiece out of your mouth, because that's the point where you might have a convulsion. And if that happens at that point, you're going to drown. So use a bail of valve. And use a mouthpiece retaining strap. And my last talk was all about this. And you can see this is a photograph here of me. I think it was in Truck Lagoon. We just done one of the deeper dives. I think it's 75 meter dive. So I'm at the last decompression stop there, six meters. And I'm doing all of these things right there. I'm in the middle of the Pacific. There's no recompression chamber anywhere. There's 80 meters of water below me. Whatever happens, I'm not sinking. I've got a line to that trapeze. If I go unconscious, I'm wearing a mouthpiece strap. Hopefully, my airway will, airway will be protected. And even if the diver puts me to the surface, which, which should be my buddy's protocol, I'm not drowning. I might be bent, but I'm not, I'm not dead by drowning. So think about these things. Mouthpiece retaining straps, you know, been used by militaries for the last 60 odd years. Here's an old photograph in the 70s. Here's a con more contemporary photograph from last year, an uh, a combined oxygen nitrox rebreather I was test diving. I'm using a mouthpiece retaining strap. It's a standard item of rebreathers for military use and there's a growing uh, sort of weight of, uh, of, of opinion behind the use of this now within sport diving the rebreather training council uh, just recently a couple of weeks ago released a safety guidance notice on the subject go to their website and um, there's as I said guidance notice there which I've written and also a formal uh, a formal peer-reviewed paper to support this guidance notice regarding the the safety benefits of wearing a mouthpiece restraining strap should you go unconscious. So that's really the impact of uh, of all those studies. You know, for us today, we need to be very wary of oxygen toxicity. Um, it can bite us uh, out of nowhere. So we must have an understanding of that fact and put in place some mitigation. Because we're doing some pretty extreme things these days. 
not so much myself these days. You've got people down at 150, 180, 200 meters on the breeders these days. You've got people five miles back in the caves. This is extreme stuff unheard of 20 years ago. Phenomenal stuff. True exploration. But the physiology hasn't changed. So we need to take precautions against all the diver ills that we understand. So let's go back to Sydney Walcott. Um, Sydney was one of the test divers who actually who then went on to um, get deployed into the operational teams. And he later won a Distinguished Service Medal for an attack on Japanese shipping in Phuket in Thailand. To quote Sydney, I have a medal now, but it does not belong to me. It also belongs to the other guinea pigs. So thanks very much for your attention, guys. Um, for those who managed to stay to the end, um, yeah, quite a journey. So that's it for me. I think it may be question time now, possibly for a wee while. Um, but Dave, um, if over to you again. Thanks very much.